So I, I like that you talked about like a mind map or a mental model, and, and that's how I like to think about things. So this is a slide deck that I've been trying to kind of pitch customers a lot, uh, just kind of showcasing, you know, how can you infuse AI and develop these intelligent apps with semantic kernel, Copilot stack, et cetera, just kind of set the stage. I like to think in terms of like how we are going to approach this, uh, sort of like the mental models of uh, things, if you will. People are going to baby step their way to embed intelligence, I think. Like, you know, it's going to be a phased approach, if you will. And I think the first phase is always like, okay, at the end of the day, it's just an API call. You know, I can just go spin up a model and I'll have an API. It's a REST call. You know, I'll just go ahead and play that. And I think we do a good job with um, the OpenAI Playground. You know, you kind of start here. And I think anyone who starts with the OpenAI models have, have kind of done this. You play with the temperature or whatever, and then just do some chat stuff um, or chat GPT. That's the way it works. And then the other one is, um, yeah, you start to kind of learn concepts about in-context learning capability that they have and prompt engineering. And then I think the next phase is to start, you know, augmenting your own sort of authoritative data sets to make the models output uh, more relevant for your needs. And that's where I think, you know, orchestrators like Semantic Kernel can play a easy role to be able to uh, do augmentation um, and achieve domain specificity. You know, there's obviously like plugins now uh, with the whole open AI, open AI uh, function extensions. Uh, this is where you might get exposed to vector stores and then you'll, you know, kind of understand that the models are representing information in a certain way in these high dimensional vectors. And there is actually a lot of value in taking your information, sort of vectorizing, getting those embeddings. And there are these purpose built databases or database extensions that allow you to store and retrieve. Um, so, so there's all these concepts that you get exposed to, and then you get exposed to these new design patterns like the RAG pattern to ground the model's output. And then there's the new way is to kind of give agency, right, to build these agents. And I think Semantic Kernel's Planner, uh, which is evolving fast, does a really good job at allowing you to do that. Uh, there's a lot of closed loop ones as well. So, so I, I like to think in these mental models. The other mental model that I have, oh, I'm still working on this diagram, but uh, basically how to achieve sort of domain specificity or improve task accuracy. This is another one that I tried to kind of create. So I think we're all visual learners. Um, there's a lot of concepts and you know text. So I try to kind of like what you're doing with your newsletter, you know, to customers, I try to bring some clarity through visualizing and mapping these concepts to their problem sets. You know, one thing every customer wants to do is the models are great, but I want to make sure that it is accurate with the tasks that I'm trying to achieve. Um, so one thing I kind of laid out is, look, it's a trade-off, you know, with how you do that, um, like everything in life. So you can, and, 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 and basically what I'm trying to do with this one is mapping the main ways that we can achieve sort of domain specificity with these models. And I think most of the time, you know, we're going to just be doing prompt engineering, right? Exploiting that in context learning capabilities that these models have where, you know, there's sort of zero shot prompt. Oops. There's, you know, all these concepts, right? Like zero shot prompting or, you know, all these knobs and configurations that we can adjust to get the model to be more accurate. And then there, there are all these prompt engineering topics as well, like few shot prompts or role prompt and chain of thought, tree of, tree of thought, and, you know, all these patterns, right? We can maybe, we can have a whole hour on these topics. Uh, and then I think orchestrators like Semantic Kernel is how you can sort of infuse uh, AI and, and do prompt engineering in a sort of scalable fashion, if you will. Um, with your product experiences. So I think that's where it's very important. And most of the time, like for most folks, you know, if you have models that are like, you know, 4K, which is about five pages or 8, 8K. Um, so, so one thing for the audience that might not know, these models have limitations on how much context it can hold, uh, depending on the model. Uh, I think the max that we have with GPT-4 is 32K for now. Um, and that's basically roughly 40 pages of text. And if you have about like 100,000 tokens, if you will, or, you know, type of um, domain knowledge that you want the model to follow, I think prompt engineering, you can achieve, you know, you can chunk that 
for uh, uh, stuff and then do, you know, like retrieval augmented generation pattern and things like that and try to get more accurate responses by just doing prompt engineering. Um, so this is what I tell customers like, hey, you don't need to like, you know, there's a lot of talk about fine tuning and stuff. And yeah, there is maybe some value there, but most of the time just stick to prompt en engineering. And I think if you want like a more, if you want the model to like focus on a few areas in its response or output in a certain style, like you're maybe a customer, um, uh, a call center co-pilot or something, and you know you don't want it to, you don't want the model to like pontificate on some random topics. Uh, you want it to, let's say, stay focused on you know call center topics. You can like fine tune it. It's not going to learn new knowledge per se, but at least it will, you know, try to um be a better version you know for your task if you will and this is the whole rlhf stuff and all, all that and, and basically you know microsoft we have you know azure ml foundation model hub or catalog where you can find you models these open source models and then you can also like leverage our optimization stack or our uh, parameter efficient fine tuning methods that Microsoft Research can open source, and it's pretty much the industry norm to use these two type of things. Um, and then the other one is uh, really like what Bloomberg did, you know, with Bloomberg GPT. Kind of if you have, if you want that differentiated, you know, uh, capability in a model, then you really can do like a data mix and pre-train your own. Maybe this is where you know in three years everyone will be, or a lot of people will be. But for now, it's super expensive. You know, it's you require a ton of data. Like you know, we're talking you know billion plus tokens and um, a lot more actually. Um, and then it's super expensive. And honestly, there's not enough GPUs to do this stuff. So just trying to visually map for customers again to drive clarity. Um, yeah, this is just another mental model that I try to employ. Yeah, this is really good. Really, if you're a hobbyist like ML person or just trying to tinker with with stuff um, to if you're like a very advanced enterprise. Interestingly enough, like it's like it's not the case that, oh yeah, advanced enterprise, just go for the pre-training approach. If anything, I think uh, because there's this capacity constraint problem right now and will likely be for the foreseeable future. Yeah, as you said, pre-training or, or training these models from scratch, even if you did have all the data, which is already a, a hurdle in and of itself. Yeah, it's a very expensive endeavor, and it may not always be better than uh, just regular or more effective prompt engineering. So uh, yeah. so I, I do like this breakdown a lot. Very helpful mental model. Cool. Yeah, uh, and then I have a few others. Um, this is just talking about how GitHub does. I found this cool blog post where, again, I, I like I like visuals that explain, you know, sort of first principles. You know, when we use GitHub Copilot, yeah, it's great, but I really want to understand. And there was this really nice blog post on 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 GitHub Copilot X, I think something. Like it really talks about you know how they do it, and it's pretty much you know what. People are doing with semantic kernel with the rack pattern, right? They have a vector database that's local, you know, but it's the same idea. They have a prompt library, they, you know, augment and then send that to the model. And then, yeah, it's doing the same thing. And then show that ghost text and then you hit tab and then it completes. <laughs> but of course, it's, you know, more efficient, I'm sure, with how they do it. Um, so, so this is really how customers are kind of trying to adopt the copilot stack. So in order to do that, again, I have this sort of sample and this workshop that kind of tries to surface up these concepts through use cases. Uh, because I think like, you know, we humans, we care about like stories and, and how it solves our problem. So while there's a lot of stuff there, I think if we just break it down, like if we were to distill, you know, a lot of these things into like the sort of first principles of it, you know, they really are solving for example, the main thing is, you know, synthesis, like um, the whole or old wor world of like, you know, I do a keyword based lookup, I get a bunch of blue links, I go click on them and, you know, in my head, I try to uh, synthesize is gone. I think it's just like, I have a question, I have an answer, you know, you do all the, you know, orchestration, whatever, and then just answer in a natural language. I think that is going to be the way most companies are going to adopt. So I have an example with semantic kernel, like how, you know, that pattern can be achieved. 
using like a vector database and using connectors and plugins. But, but through like an actual use case, I try to surface up, okay, now this is how you do that. This is how you initialize the kernel. Uh, you know, this is like how you have your prompt template or, or you know, in, in, the, in the skills, how do you, you know, tweak the configurations. And then I need to complete that. But basically, these are native connectors. You know, how can you just the whole whole thing um, through code and through a story? I try to convey. And I have other use cases as well that I'm kind of documenting, like how like the whole traditional sort of you know, there's a generative AI and then there's discriminative AI. Right? Like how do you like a traditional narrow ML model can now be rethought? Maybe you don't need like this you know one model that was trained on labeled data sets. To I'm sure you you've seen like uh, you know, Jin Yang from Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. Hot dog, not hot dog, right? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that is changing too. Like, okay, you have one size fits all, you know, general purpose model. Uh, let's apply it to do classification or, you know, traditional machine learning tasks like uh, named entity recognition or obviously summarization. Uh, there's just so many, like, it, it's crazy how, ma how much we can do. Um, so that's kind of the approach I'm taking with this. And uh, yeah, the sample that you mentioned uh, with that is is Miyagi, uh, which, by the way, thank you for also kind of talking about it. And I, I try to catch uh, or keep up with how much you guys are doing. It's kind of hard, but it's trying to highlight like all the semantic kernel capabilities through those use cases and also others as well um, that I'm seeing from customers and within the sort of thing about uh, the Copilot stack. So like within our Copilot stack, you know, we have like a bunch of things there, like how can we, um, you know, use that to build these new front ends, you know, like a plugin on a chat GPT. Um, and how do you make use of new concepts like vector databases and all that stuff uh, within like at, by using like traditional sort of Azure primitives. So there's a lot of like APIM, uh, basically like a gateway plus the model pattern that we're seeing a lot from customers. So we're trying to highlight that here. And how do you host a chat GPT plugin securely behind like Azure in like an enterprise grade setting? Yeah, just things like that. Yeah, and it's fully open source, right? People can yeah, yeah, yeah. go in, Anybody can look at go it. In and, yeah, they absolutely. can they can run their own workshop, probably. <laughs> so that that is the idea. Some things you can't. So for example, I have two modules, the architecture design session and the discovery session, where actually um, um, I have a sort of um, link to John Midas design thinking as well here. But essentially I have like a um, Figma template that, you know, customers can kind of fork and then they can um, start like, you know, it can be like an active session where we can pick whichever mental model that they're, that they're familiar with, either jobs to be done or whatever. And then um, this way, as they go through the workshop, it'll be more relevant for their use cases. Um, and the last section is like, an architecture design session that is also one on one with the customer. But other than that, the other use cases, yeah, I'm hoping to kind of document here and kind of do it on your own type of thing. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, that's a very uh, thorough, compelling walkthrough. I, I think it's amazing to see the inside the mind of, of Govind. So uh, thank you for, for walking us through that.